This video talks about the CMOS Smith trigger, which is a circuit useful in generating Lian pulses from a noisy input signal or in the design of oscillator circuits. We are going to see an example of both use cases. We start showing you on the left the classic inverter symbol and the inverter transfer curve. You see in the inverter we have three regions, in the first and the third regions we have one transistor off and one on. But in the second region we have both transistors on, and in the middle of this region we have the switching point VSP, that is the input voltage above or below which the output changes its state. On the right we have the symbol and transfer curve of the Smith trigger. We note that the symbol and transfer curve are similar to that of the inverter, but here we have two switching points VSPL and VSPH, and the curve is well defined, so the slope is higher than that of the inverter. So the output transitions are faster. Now, before seeing the circuit, let's see the working of the Schmidt trigger in the transfer curve. We assume to start from zero as input voltage. In this situation, the output is high at VDD. If we increase the input voltage, the output remains at the VDD value. Moreover, the output remains at the VDD even if the input voltage goes above VSPL, but when the input arrives to VSPH, the output goes to zero very fast. This is the high switching point in which the high to low transition occurs. If we keep increasing the input voltage, the output remains to zero, and if we go back below VSPH, the output still remains to zero till the moment we decrease the input voltage till VSPL value. In this case, the output switches from low to high in a very sharply way, and this is the low switching point. If we keep decreasing the input voltage, the output remains high. So in order to switch the output from high to low, the input must go to VSPH or above. And in order to switch the output from low to high, the input must go to VSPL or below. The difference between VSPH and VSPL is called hysteresis. The hysteresis present in the transfer curve is what sets the Schmidt trigger apart from the basic inverter. Here we show a possible input to the Schmidt trigger and the resulting output. When the output is high, and the input exceeds VSPH, the output switches slow. However, the input voltage must go below VSPL before the output can switch high again. So, note that we have a clean output signal even if the input is noisy. Now, let's see the working principle of the basic CMOS Schmidt trigger. You immediately see the similarity with the inverter schematic. Let's say the input is zero. In this case, the output is high because M4 and M5 are on, connecting the output with VDD. If the output is high, M6 is off and M3 is on. The point X is at a voltage Vx equals VDD minus V threshold of M3. If we increase V in, nothing happens till V in reaches the value of the threshold voltage of M1. In this moment, M1 turns on and Vx starts lowering. The current IM1 is equal to the current IMM3. You see that if we keep increasing V in and Vx keeps lowering, the voltage between gate and source of M2 keeps increasing, and at some point that we call the high switching point, V in is equal to V threshold of M2 plus Vx. So in this moment, M2 turns on, lowering sharply the output voltage. Sharply because M2 is designed to act as switch, with a low resistance, so when it turns on, the voltage across it is more or less zero, so the output immediately reaches the Vx value, which already started lowering. And since Vx keeps lowering, Vgs of M2 keeps increasing, so M2 is always more on, lowering its resistance. Going the output to zero, M3 turns off and M6 on. So adding transistor M3 allows us to keep the output high till the input reaches VSPH and it helps in the fast transition of the output because M2 acts as switch and it shorts the output to point X, so the decrease in the output voltage is well defined. If we keep the input at a high value, nothing changes on the output. M6 is on and point Y is at the V threshold of M6. 
If we start lowering the input voltage, replicating the reasoning for the P portion of the circuit, we have to decrease till point VSPL to make the output switch to the high value again. In this way, adding M3 and M6 to an inverter configuration, we create the hysteresis we wanted. Now let's see how to size the transistors in order to define the low and high switching points. We see that when M1 is on, the current in M1 is equal to the current in M3, so we can write this relation. When V in reaches VSPH, this relation is true, and we set V threshold of M2 equals to V threshold of M3, having also the source in common. Combining this equation, we get this relation. Repeating the reasoning on the P portion of the circuit, we get this other relation. We add this other relation in which we choose beta 2, so the ratio W over L of the MOSFET 2, 5 times that of the MOSFET 1 and 3, because we want MOSFET 2 acting as switch. So, if we choose VTD as 5V, VSPL as 2 and VSPH at 3V, we get this relation that allows us to choose properly the ratios W over L of the transistors in order to get the wanted VSPL and VSPH. As first application, consider this situation. A pulse with ringing is a common voltage waveform encountered in buses or lines interconnecting systems. If this voltage is applied directly to a logic gate or inverter input with a VSP of 2.5V, the output of the gate will vary with the period of the ringing on top of the pulse. Using a Schmitt trigger with properly designed switching points can eliminate this problem. The Schmitt trigger can also be used as an oscillator. The delay time in charging and discharging the capacitor is used to set the oscillation frequency. At the moment in the time when the output of the Schmitt trigger switch is low, the voltage across the capacitor is VSPH. The capacitor will start to discharge toward ground and the voltage across the capacitor is given by this relation, and this is the curve of the voltage across the capacitor. At the time in which the voltage decreases till VSPL, the Schmitt trigger switches high. So the first time of the oscillation period is the discharging time of the capacitor T1 equals this. When the output is high, the capacitor starts charging from the VSPL level with this relation, and when it arrives to the VSPH level, the Schmitt trigger switches again. So the second time of the oscillation period is the charging time of the capacitor from VSPL to VSPH. So the oscillation period is this, and the capacitance used in this equation is the sum of the input capacitance of the Schmitt trigger and any external capacitance. So acting on the parameters of the MOSFETs, we can choose the proper low and high switching points which with a proper external capacitance allows us to set the wanted oscillation frequency. Here we see another example of the use of the Schmitt trigger in a voltage control oscillator. Let's see the working principle of this voltage control oscillator using a Schmitt trigger. Here we set the input voltage by means we want to control the oscillation frequency. M1, M5 and M4, M6 are in a current mirror configuration. So, the current ID generated acting on V in VCO is mirrored in the other branch of the circuit. Let's call ID4 the current flowing in M4 and ID1 the current flowing in M1. These currents can be different from ID because the mirror is not perfect and the output resistance of the mirror is not infinite. Now, let's see this portion of the circuit. We have basically three inverters in series, although one of them is the Schmitt trigger plus a positive feedback. So this is something similar to a ring oscillator, which is an unstable circuit because when the output is high, the feedback fed the input of the first inverter to high so that its output is low and the output of the Schmitt trigger is high, changing the output in low and so on. The circuit is unstable, but it is able to maintain this instability through the Schmitt trigger and the capacitor, which needs some time to reach the Schmitt trigger switching points. So let's assume the output is low. In this case, is also low the input of the first inverter, and PMOS M3 is on, so ID4 charges the capacitor. The capacitor keeps charging up to the voltage VSPH. 
level in which the Smith trigger switches the output from high to low. The time needed for charging the capacitor from VSPL to VSPH is this one. You see it depends on ID4, which is the current flowing through M4 and M3, which in turn depends on V in VCO, the input voltage. Now we see what happens when the output is high. In this case, the input of the first inverter is also high and M2 is on. So we create a path towards ground and the capacitor starts to discharge, lowering the voltage in the input of the Schmidt trigger. When the input voltage arrives to VSPL, the output of the Schmidt trigger changes from low to high. So the output of the circuit changes again. The time needed for discharging the capacitor to VSPL is this one, and it depends on the current ID1, which in turn depends on the input voltage V in VCO. So the oscillation period is this one, and if we assume ID4 equals ID1, the oscillation frequency is this. We see the oscillation frequency depends on ID current, which is related to V in VCO through this other relation. So the frequency varies with the square root of the input voltage. The Schmidt trigger is not easily optimized for high speed. The effective switching resistance of the MOSFETs are difficult to reduce without changing the switching point voltages. So you cannot reach high frequency with this circuit. Please leave me a comment, let me know if you liked this video. Make sure you put a thumb up, click the notification bell and subscribe to my channel.